Hi, everybody. Um, this is the third installment of Posted. When we left off, um, we were hearing about his people, his tribe, Wolf, Dee Dee, um, Bench, and him, who's now we know his name is Eric, but we don't know much more about him. So we're going to continue reading. Next chapter is called The Crackdown. I should stop, stop and tell you about them, the tribe. Maybe it'll help you understand what happened. Maybe not. Maybe there's no explanation. Maybe my dad is right, and people are just basically jerks. It, seems, it does seem that way sometimes. I have this theory. I call it the theory of sociomagnetic homogeny. A bunch of big words. But it basically says that people gravitate towards people who share their interests and whatnot. Band kids will hang out with other band kids. People with pierced tongues will hang out with people with pierced noses. The basketball players will clump together like cat hair on a sofa. Kids whose lawyer fathers drive heated leather-seated sports cars hang out with other kids whose lawyer fathers drive heated leather-seated sports cars. There are exceptions, of course. But all other things being equal, you merge with the crowd that reminds you the most of you. That's not original, I guess, and it's mostly just common sense. But I took it one step further. My theory has to do with the people who don't find people just like them. These people, they find each other. And then they realize that not finding people like them is the thing they have in common. That's what happened to me, I think. I found the people who weren't quite like other people, and we used that difference as glue. There were four of us, all boys, and we were all smart, or at least above the nat national average according to state-mandated standardized tests. So we had that too. What we didn't have was a tribe, so we made one. For me, at least, it started with Bench. Real name, Jeremiah Jones. His parents and teacher call him JJ, but we don't call each other by our real names. You can blame me for that one. Bench does sports, the big three of football, basketball, and baseball. But he's not that good at any of them. Not good enough to start anyways. So mostly he just moves from bench to bench, waiting for the fourth quarter or the ninth inning when the game is completely out of hand and putting him in won't really cost anything or alter the fabric of the universe. The cool thing about bench is that he doesn't seem to care that he's not very good. He just enjoyed being part of the team. The other players didn't mind having him around because he was a nice guy who also never threatened to replace them. And the coaches liked him because he was an A student and he never complained. Bench was BMS's poster boy for student athletes. He brought the cumulative GPA of the basketball team up. It was good for us because being attached to Bench, the rest of us were mostly ignored by the other jocks. We didn't care that he never scored a single goal. In fact, it was probably better for us that he didn't. It's not as if the starting quarterback sat at our table. Besides, Bench could at least make a free throw, which is more than can be said for Didi, a.k.a. Advik Patel, the third member of our tribe. His dad is Indian, which Ben says should make him genetically inclined to love cricket, at least. But Advik prefers to fight dragons instead. Didi is short for D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons, which is way too geeky to say out loud, even for us. But he says none of us can pronounce his real name right anyway, so Didi's fine with him. Unlike Bench, who has an inch on me at least, Didi's a full two inches shorter than I am, with shorter black hair and an even shorter attention span. And he knows way too much about Tolkien and Harry Potter and Gary Gizagax. You probably don't know who Gary Gizagax is, and even if you do, you probably wouldn't admit it, and I don't blame you. There are some things that have to stay among their tribe. Didi's a polyhedral dice junkie. That's what you call those dice with so many different faces. He has a collection of them tucked away in his wooden box shaped like a treasure chest under his bed. Clear ones, colored ones, ones that look like they've been chiseled out of marble, little pyramids that go up to four, and giant angular eyeballs that go all the way up to 60. I won't bother telling you what most 13-year-old boys keep hidden underneath their beds, but I'll guarantee you it's not dice. He also keeps one in his pocket, a 10-sider with a dragon place of the number one. He insists it's good luck. He uses it to make pretty much all his major life decisions. We played D&D &D with D.D. on the weekend, so long as both wasn't out of town at a recital and Bench didn't have some kind of camp or practice. Turns out I'm almost always available. D.D. was the dungeon master, of course. Bench was a hulking barbarian with too many swords. I was an elfish thief who went around stabbing everyone in the back. Wolf was a bard. He stood in the back and played his music and tried to stay out of the way. That's called typecasting. Wolf is short for Wolfgang, which is short for Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, because, as Wolf puts it, he could never pull off the nickname Mozart. Of course, he can't pull off Wolf either, but we let that go, mostly because his real name is Morgan, which at some point became more popular for girls than boys.
Nothing about Wolf looks particularly wolfish. Maybe starved Wolf who doesn't get out of the cave much. Lanky limbs and freckly face and moppish blonde hair that he's constantly brushing out of his eyes. What he is, though, is a piano prodigy. Three times since Folsom County Award winner, Junior's Division. Wolf has been playing since he was five. Mostly classical, some jazz. He can actually play that Bumblebee song, you know, the one that sounds like the piano itself is having a seizure. We keep begging him to put his talents to good use and write rock songs, but his parents don't believe in good music. They believe in Chopin and perfect posture and two hours of practice a day. Wolf sits on a bench almost as much as Bench does. Except we're all pretty sure that Bench is never going to be a starting quarterback for the Lions, despite all of the talk of him Sunday winning the Super Bowl. Wolf is different. Someday we're all going to go watch him play at Carnegie Hall. He'll be wearing a tuxedo and a white bow tie to match the keys, and the three of us will have front row seats. Bench, Dee Dee, and Wolf. My tribe. My people. Not that we couldn't have tried to fit in somewhere else. I mean, Bench had guys he knuckle-bumped in the hallway from various teams. Wolf knew people in the band. Even Dee Dee had a couple of kids he went to summer camp with. But there was just something that drew the four of us together. We just got each other. It was easy. We knew where we'd belong. I mean, there were others sometimes. Nomads. People who hadn't found their tribe yet. People like Nips. Suplurbius. Third nipple on the right just below his second. And Crash. Skateboard versus car. Car one. But for the most part, it was just the four of us. Bench, Dee Dee, Wolf, and me. My name is Frost. Cool, right? Trust me, it's not. But at least it's better than Nips. Ruby's text, as seen by Miss Shears, and then the Big Ham, and eventually most of the student body, was, as one concerned teacher put it, the straw that broke the camel's back. Though, if I had to guess, I'd say that camel was pretty much dead before Ruby had her phone taken away. After all, there had been several incidents of technology misuse before Ruby's rant against Mr. Jackson. There were Facebook posts, bad pictures on Instagram, a whole Snapchat exchange that two kids got sent home for for three days. There were flame wars, threats, at least a dozen instances of kids getting caught using their phones to cheat on tests. No doubt Principal Whittingham had hundreds more occurrences written up in his files, more than enough to fuel a crusade. But Ruby's text was simply the spark, a catalyst. Word spread quickly outside the walls of Bratton Middle School. Kids told their parents. Parents told other parents. Whittingham sent a message to every family calling for a school community meeting. In the span of 48 hours, it suddenly became clear to every teacher, parent, and administrator that cell phones, with their texts and their apps and their electric buzzy addictiveness, were no longer just a nuisance. They represented a clear and present danger to every student at the middle school. The meeting was held. Studies were cited. Statistics were shown. Other school systems were held up as models. Turns out cell phones were what was to blame for every single thing going wrong in the world. They weren't just the primary avenue for bullying, though that was brought up several times. They were also eating away at our brain cells. They were also solely responsible for the decline in test scores, in our county in particular, and for the failure of the American education system in general. They call us cancer. They could suck out your souls. They were the next step in mankind's eventual demise. Forget the fact that half the adults in the room were using their cell phones to get those statistics for why cell phones were bad. The point was, in school anyway, cell phones were a menace. Confiscating them, Principal Whitcomb argued, is not simply a matter of sound educational policy. It's in our best national interest. A vote was taken. Majority ruled. The students got no say. A new school policy was written in the school code book. No more cell phones. Period. Not in lockers, not in pockets, not in backpacks. They were to stay home. If you absolutely had to bring one in for emergency reasons or to be used after school, it had to be turned in at the office at the start of the day, placed in a labeled Ziploc baggie, and kept there until the final bell. If your parents had called to tell you that your Aunt Tilda slipped in the bathroom and hit herself in the eye with her own toothbrush, the secretary would have to take a message and you would have to be called down to the office. Principal Whittingham could not control what was said and done off school grounds, but when we were inside those cinder block walls of the middle school, there would be no texting, no calling, no posting, no playing, no surfing. We were to learn. Case closed. A few parents protested. They complained that their kids had a right to keep the electronic devices on them at all times. The administration reminded them there was nothing in the Constitution specifically governing them the individual rights of cell phone carrying minors. Having a phone was a privilege and one that the students of the middle school of Britain had found.